All right, everybody. Well, hello. Um, start things off now. We've given people a couple more minutes. I assume that there will be a few more people still joining in as we go. Uh, but I'll start the introduction now and then um, Chris can speak. So uh, first of all, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Carbon 613's virtual speaker series with Kirsten Pullis from Efficiency Canada. Um, some info about EnviroCenter. For those of you who don't know us, uh, EnviroCenter is a nonprofit environmental organization based here in Ottawa. Our core mission supports sustainable lifestyles, which means that we encourage people to take action on climate in their own lives, in their homes, their workplaces and businesses, their communities, and right here in our city. By pointing for folks toward practical ways to reduce their environmental impact, we help them make lasting, positive change. Our work focuses on four key areas, green homes, green transportation, green business, and green lifestyle. And today we're here to talk about green business. So um, our green business program, Carbon 613, helps local businesses achieve their sustainability goals by sharing knowledge, resources, and tools for tracking greenhouse gas emissions and setting a reduction target. Carbon 613 is part of a network of Green Economy Canada hubs with more than 275 member businesses across Ontario, allowing us to provide broad support with a local focus. Our virtual speaker series will host a fresh guest each month and will cover a variety of topics related to business sustainability. Uh, for more information, you can visit www.envirocenter.ca slash greenyourbusiness. Um, and to stay up to date, uh, please sign up for our newsletter. We'll be posting a link in the chat. My colleague Mandy will set that up. And a few logistical notes before I introduce uh, our speaker today. Um, please note that this session is being recorded uh, and will be shared online after the event. Um, please keep yourself muted during the presentation so that everyone is able to hear Kirsten speaking. Uh, and we will be monitoring questions in the chat box, so please type them there and we'll bring them forward to Kirsten at the end for a Q&A period. Um, and with that, I will introduce Kirsten. So today we're joined by Kirsten Pullis, Community Organizer for Efficiency Canada. Uh, she began her organizing career at the age of 18 when she traveled to the United States for three months, living out of a van and advocating for North Korean human rights. Since then, she has completed a bachelor's degree in global and international studies at Carleton University, focusing in global development and economics. During her studies, Kirsten completed four research projects on subjects at the nexus of economic growth, policy, and sustainability, including a mapping project of gender lens investors to identify entrepreneurial leaders and leading a volunteer team to explore the fair trade market. Outside of work, Kirsten can usually be found on a bus somewhere. As a founding member of Free Transit Ottawa, she has spent four years building support for concrete policy changes at the municipal level. As the leader of the Transit Week Challenge, Kirsten got Ottawa City Councillors on the bus with her for a week last year. Once again, welcome to everyone in our audience, and Kirsten, you have the digital floor. Awesome. Thanks, Evan. So I'll just get ready to share my screen here. Let me get this all lined up. So thanks for the great introduction. And yeah, today I'm gonna to be talking about energy efficiency and how it's more than just saving money. I think that often energy efficiency is the most glamorous policy or the most exciting kind of work that you can do, but I'm hoping that I can change your mind about that today. And so I'm gonna be talking about a few different aspects of energy efficiency and some different topics. So I'll be starting with my own story and how I got here our story of energy efficiency as an organization. And then I'm gonna talk about three aspects of why we support energy efficiency. For the economy, for economic recovery, COVID-19, and for your own business, if you're someone who has a business or is interested in bringing energy efficiency policies to your organization. And then I'm gonna end by talking a bit about efficiency advocacy. So if you decide that you wanna support this kind of work, how can you do it and what steps can you take? So I'm going to start with my own story. And as I said, I'm a community organizer with Efficiency Canada. And some of you hear that and you kind of wonder what that actually means or what I do. And so as a community organizer, my role is to bring people in the energy efficiency sector and encourage them to advocate for their work, advocate for energy efficiency policies, and just be champions for the sector. And so I do that by starting conversations between people, um, organizing events, and just finding creative ways to get people in the same room and on the same side. And I started this work, uh, again, as I've been said, with Liberty in North Korea when I was 18. And what I found with that work was that I got to see firsthand how working together with people and sharing stories and connecting on that personal level can inspire change and encourage people to take action. Through my time with Free Transit Ottawa, I've gotten to see um, basically just how politicians are people, how the political system works in different ways, and to learn a bit about how you can try to bring a community together. 
And so now I get to work with the amazing energy efficiency community. And what I love most about energy efficiency is how it's, it's both about people and environment. It's one of these policies where it's not a trade-off between having a growing and a strong economy and also a green and sustainable um, environment and future. And so my job and my interest is to empower people to make that happen. And so to talk a little bit about our story as an organization, we are Efficiency Canada. We've been around for about two years now, and we are Canada's national think tank for energy efficiency. We have a lot of fun, we work really hard, and we move quickly. We're a small team, and so that lets us be really responsive to things as they come up. Sometimes you'll see a policy announced somewhere that really needs a quick either support or someone to step in, try to slow that policy down before it gets put in place. We're good at being responsive and kind of entrepreneurial in that sense. I'm going to show you a few statistics that just give you a glimpse about why we do the work that we do. And so one stat here is that the right energy efficiency policies could enable the world to achieve more than 40% of the emissions cuts needed to reach the Paris Agreement targets. For some people, when they're energy efficiency, they think of LED light bulb and hydro bills. But we know that there's a lot more to it. The environmental potential is huge. And like this says here, some studies say that it could get us 40% of the way to our, um, our targets. And that's using existing technologies. But there's more than that. Ramping up efficiency investments could increase Canada's energy by $42.5 billion. And that's net other impacts like the decreased energy usage. So it doesn't require this trade-off between growth and green. Ramping up our programs to meet the performance levels of leading American states could mean a huge boost to our annual GDP. And it's also a job creator. Most energy efficiency technology has to be implemented manually, which means that investments lead to huge levels of job creation. So the stat here says that we would see 16 to 30 jobs created per $1 million invested into energy efficiency. Uh, work like doing a deep retrofit on an example stimulates a lot of different supply chains. You'll see windows and doors, heat system, insulation and roofing and more, and um, all going into this one project. And these are investments that can happen across the country from big cities to small towns, from Southern Ontario to the rural territories. And all of this will be a key part of a just transition where workers are moving from these sunset in industries and relocated into thriving green jobs. And I want to show you a video quickly, just to show that these aren't just ideas, these are real stories that we hear about every day. And oh, so I'm going to just, I got a note, I'm going to pause my video to hopefully you'll be able to hear my audio a bit better. Okay, so I'm going to switch to the video here, and hopefully everyone can see this. It's a story from someone that we work with who transitioned from the oil and gas sector to working in energy efficiency. And just uh, send me a message in the chat if you find that the audio is too loud or too quiet. I own business in Medicine Hat. I've been involved in the insulation since about 1980 when our oil pack suffered a downturn and a friend of mine had an uh, in, uh, insulation company work and I, I'm still here today. So my job in the oil and gas industry was uh, a, a, a firefighter to be my own boss. So I started Energy Plus Insulation. By making a home more energy efficient, it makes it more marketable. It becomes more comfortable. So we've had people say, thank you very much for bringing up the price of our home, the equity. Sometimes it's um, it's flattering, it's overwhelming. I left with a dozen donuts, uh, cans of fruit. There's what gives me the most joy. There's a variety of things. Uh, making the homes more energy efficient. A homeowner that wasn't on the same page as me, and I was leaving. Says, would you please come back in? And we hit the same page. And for people to say, wow, I saved this much money on my utility bills. It's never negative. We all know it's a non-renewable resource. And if we can't make our homes energy efficient, it's straight up, it's greenhouse emissions. If you've got children and grandchildren, it's going to affect them. I think 
should be a recognized sector for energy efficiency to make our homes more efficient. Let's fight the problem we have with real simple things that are people involved in this sector and we really are seeing the changes that we talk about. So ultimately just a good policy. Energy efficiency programs have been implemented by conservative, liberal, and NDP governments. They've been introduced at the municipal, provincial, federal level. The right policies can help combat energy poverty, investments into buildings, make them more resilient to climate shocks, and important right now is they create healthy indoor environments. It's the cheapest source of new energy that's available to utilities. And from heaters to electric cars to windows, the technology is there and it's ready to be implemented. And so what I want to turn to next is how we think that these policies can be mobilized for an effective economic recovery after COVID-19. So we have this great set of policy choices. They create jobs and they make our lives better. They lower emissions. But can we mobilize them in the face of COVID-19 for both immediate and long-term economic recovery? We're already seeing a lot of evidence that if there is a stimulus plan introduced, it's going to be a green stimulus. For example, we saw that Trudeau's corporate relief loans were tied to publishing annual reports on climate investments. And uh, companies were expected to detail how they plan to reduce their environmental footprints and how their operations support the country's commitments made under the Paris Climate Agreement. But there are a lot of different groups who are fighting to have their policy solutions at the top of the list for stimulus spending. There's good evidence, like I said, that the spending will target clean initiatives, but it's not clear exactly what policies are at the top of the list. And the chosen initiatives can have really different impacts, either as short-term sparks or to inspire long-term changes. And with the spending that's coming, um, it's expected to be a large amount and it's hard to turn back from that. So the outcomes that we choose now will have really long-term impacts. We're front-loading years of spending and putting ourselves on track towards long-term targets. And we think that energy efficiency investments could leverage the spending for not only short-term relief, but also lay out a trail of high value investments for years to come, while also positioning Canada as a global energy efficiency leader. And so just to really learn what we think this could look like and how these policies can get our economy back on track, we envision it as being three steps. So the first is relief, the second is stimulus, and the third is recovery. And the first is short-term, medium-term, and long-term changes. And so for relief, we turn to online training because we need to build the workforce now to meet future labor demand needs. Uh, the efficiency sector is growing faster than a lot of sectors in our country. And we know that this training can take place during physical distancing. We need to replace an aging workforce. It's really important to integrate women into this growing field. And as an example, the Canada Green Building Council estimates that we need $500 million in workforce development and training to meet the low carbon green building objectives of uh, the current government. There already has been some funding from NRCAN, and we've been developing an online database that summarizes all of the online training that's available right now if someone wants to learn more about energy efficiency or step into the sector. When we've got through that immediate relief phase, we need to turn to stimulus. And at this point, we need a supply of projects to meet that demand of labor that we've been creating. And uh, what this can mean is that the infrastructure already exists for energy efficiency programming and it's ready to be scaled up. Our organization publishes a a scorecard every year. So we compare the efforts of different provinces and we rank them to see who's doing the best in terms of energy efficiency. And what we found is that there's already program budgets totaling $1.1 billion of spending in 2017. And this spans a number of different sectors. It's residential, commercial, industrial, and also targeting low income customers. But to reach the investment levels that are needed for those stats that I showed you at the start, that huge GDP growth, the huge job growth, that requires an immediate investment of $2.2 billion and a ramp up to $11.9 billion of annual average investment levels. And so we can expand the scale of existing portfolios using federal vehicles that already exist. So these programs are there and they're ready to be used. We just need to increase that flow of money that's moving to them. And then finally, when we turn to recovery, that's that long-term outlook. That's where we're moving beyond just getting back on track and building an economy that's more resilient to these kinds of shocks and that's prepared for the coming uh, 
changes to our global economy. And we do that through a green bank, which is essentially a, an institution that's able to leverage and mobilize private capital to move into these projects and ensure that it's not just public spending that's um, trying to fuel the changes that we need in our building sector and our uh, industrial sector to be more energy efficient. And so what about you? What about you as someone listening to this and who's watching this presentation? It might sound great, but it also might sound irrelevant. If you're not in one of these industries and you're not looking for a new career, what does it really mean for you? And so what I want to highlight now is that another benefit of energy efficiency is that it's sector agnostic. Industrial and commercial energy efficiency holds a lot of opportunity as a business owner, as an investor. Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. So what we find is that energy costs are the single largest controllable expense for most buildings. As an example of how, how much of a change policies can make just on that individual business level, I want to highlight the food service energy challenge case study. The title doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but it was a really cool project. We saw 45 applicants apply to the challenge in 2018, and they chose three. And those three, um, which were a national food chain, a hotel, and a student dining hall, each one of them received an ASHRAE level two energy audit. And the role of an energy audit is to kind of identify places in a building where energy efficiency can be improved. And so we found different measures specific to their own needs. And so I've just highlighted some of the really amazing results that they saw there. So for example, at Jack Astor's and Barry, they put flow restrictors on their taps, cost them $250, and they saved $5,600 in the first year. Um, and they're gonna save 81,000 kilowatt hours of energy. So it's just, it's enormous changes for really low level investments. It just requires that, that interest and engagement and taking that step to identify the possibilities there. And so what are the opportunities? If we're looking at this just pragmatically, if you just want to find the ways that this can help you and your business, uh, there's energy savings for your business and for your home. If this green bank can be put into action, there's a lot of private investment opportunities. There's obviously the emission reductions, which are just in themselves, also um, an excellent way to make your business stand out. There's new business models that can arise when we get creative and we start to think about how we can make this a large scale industry. There's new market opportunities and demand rises for these energy efficient technologies. And what we find is that when spending is put towards programs that target, for example, low income customers, then a lot of the savings that they get from these energy efficiency technologies goes towards spending. So we see a lot of them. Um, a lot of the waves in the economy from the initial investment. And so it just tends to be good economic policy when you're looking at it just from that pragmatic perspective. And so if you're sold, if, uh, if I've convinced you and you're interested and you wanna know how these policies can get the spotlight that they, that they deserve, then we have to turn to advocacy. And what we find is that business voices are particularly loud in Canadian politics. And so I wanna highlight how we approach advocacy and then some of the ways that you could get involved if you wanted to. So our of change involves three pieces that come together. They're all equally important. That's why we have them in a circle here. And they're all connected, but a little bit different. We do quite a bit of research and policy analysis because we think it's important to know what we're talking about and to have the numbers and the information to back up the things that we're saying. Uh, we also work a lot on communications because we can't just have the information. It also has to be out there. It has to be public and visible. And we have to make a lot of noise and get people talking. And then we also work on mobilization of our allies and our stakeholders. And mobilization is key because people have to really take action. Um, you can't just support something through conversations with friends, though that's important. You have to be able to put your actions on the line and make a phone call, send a letter, sign a petition, do something that shows that you really stand with these ideas. It's important to create awareness um, and it's, it's not just done by us, and that's what, um, what's really important to learn from this and to uh, consider when you see the work that's done by organizations you support is they're one voice, but that voice is multiplied by the people around them who share that information and spread the word. We advocate for the industry and we share facts and we celebrate our successes too. I think it's important to, um, 
to find those joys and find those moments where you have a victory and you can celebrate them and champion each other and be excited about the, the progress that's been made so far. What we find in this sector is that it is so diverse. There's so many people who work on energy efficiency and not all of them even recognize their role in energy efficiency. We've got engineers and architects and HVAC technicians, we have manufacturers and installers and the list goes on and on. One study found that there are more than 436,000 Canadians that work in energy efficiency. And so to make change, we need all of these different sectors and all of the communities around them to come together and advocate for the policy that we want to see. So what can you do? Uh, one way is to join our mailing list for campaign updates or updates on the sector. You can send a letter, and so I'll be sharing a link after this of how you can support our efforts for an economic recovery. And better yet, you can make a phone call. One thing we find is that emails are very common. They're important and we get a good response from them, but picking up the phone and making that phone call and having that personal connection tends to make an even bigger impact than those uh, letters that are sent. You can sign up for the Our Human Energy campaign, which is trying to get everyone in the sector on, on one playing field and recognizing their own role in energy efficiency. And we also have an allies program, which I would just encourage you to check out and talk to me about further if you're interested at all. And that's it. That's all I've got for you. And thank you guys for paying attention. I'm excited to answer some questions and hear what you've got to say. And I'm going to stop my screen share now. Well, thank you, Kirsten. That was great. Uh, really informative. Uh, lots of information there about energy efficiency for our audience. Um, I know that we have uh, one comment in the chat uh, that we can get to. So um, maybe I'll read that out uh, quickly. It looks like it's from Kevin um, saying that there's also pressure on the Trudeau government to implement regressive stimulus measures. So progressive plans aren't a given. Do you, do you have any comment on different um, stimulus measures and, and sort of what would work, what wouldn't? Yeah, so I think that uh, you're right is that we absolutely can't take it as a given. Um, we are seeing, I want to highlight some of the positive evidence that we're seeing just so that we can feel hopeful and feel excited about it in that um, there is a task force that's been put together to consider different options for a clean and green recovery. There's a few champions that are uh, ministers it's made up of a team of ministers and those are people who are championing championing a clean economic recovery uh, we did some research recently to look at different stimulus plans that have been proposed across the country and overwhelmingly we're seeing uh, voices calling for these kind of green and environmentally focused stimulus plans but you're right it's absolutely not a given and that's why it's so important right now for anyone who is interested and anyone who supports this kind of work to make their voice heard. So there's lots of ways. It's, it's not just us who is advocating for it. And if you know a local environmental organization, chances are they've said something about economic recovery or they're linked to someone who has. And so it's time to reach out. It's time to make those phone calls and it's time to send those emails. And that's how we can keep the pressure on to have this stimulus look the way we want it to and to make it a just and a clean recovery. That's great. Thank you for that answer. Um, does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to uh, ask? Feel free to unmute yourself now. We're in the question and answer portion of the presentation. So um, now's a good time if you want to unmute and uh, if you have any questions for Kirsten. I'm really nice. There's no need to be shy. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. Um, can you speak more to the, um, the programs, the ally program in particular? You, you said that you would be happy to talk to people if they were interested, but um, I don't know anything about it yet, so I don't know to what extent I am interested. So, For sure. It's a great question. I just uh, I, I didn't want to advertise this too much, and so I was trying to walk that line there a little bit. But, um, All right. Well, just to give you a <laughs> please advertise. Okay, great. So our allies program is, it's a group of people basically who or companies, um, different NGOs, there's some uh, industry associations who have decided to take a stand and really support our work and support our mission. And so it's, you make a financial contribution to our organization. And then there's a few different benefits that come along with that. First and foremost is you get to support our work, which I think is the main reason most people choose to join the program. But there's also 
uh, different marketing and communications benefits. So we do a lot of work to engage specifically with our allies and to make sure that when they um, have some kind of success, it gets highlighted to make sure that their logo and their image is on a lot of the work that we do because um, often our allies are the first ones to sign our letters or to share that work. So it's a really mutual relationship. Um, that's just, it's mostly about advancing the energy efficiency mission and there are some other benefits along with it as well. Thanks again, Kristen. Uh, anyone else with any questions uh, that we can field? Maybe I can field a quick one if uh, people are still thinking or uh, deciding if they're if they're brave enough to speak up in front of the group. But um, uh, obviously, Carbon Six One Three is a is a network of local businesses, and so we're generally trying to support their work towards energy efficiency and carbon reductions. Um, beyond sort of um, um, advocacy and, and contacting the right people. Obviously, we've just talked about the Ally program a little bit. Um, what are other ways that businesses can prepare for the kind of like economic stimulus that we might expect? Um, is it more about having shovel-ready projects or um, are, there, are there other pieces of advice that you could give to, uh, to sort of businesses or other organizations uh, to be able to take advantage of those kinds of things? Yeah, so what we're finding is that if you want to be able to sort of see the future and look ahead to what might be coming, the best uh, the best advice I can give is to look backwards because um, what we're hearing over and over again is that the policies that they want to implement will be ones that have already been announced but have been put aside or um, projects that they've already campaigned on or made promises about but they haven't been able to fulfill yet due to COVID-19 or other issues. And so if you can find policy promises or campaign promises that you think could help your business or that might lead to funding for your business. Um, those are the kinds of projects that we're likely to see in terms of um, new funding opportunities and things like that. And then uh, I would also, I, I'm going to recommend this over and over again, but I would really just recommend calling your representative because we did have a business who called one of their MLAs in New Brunswick. And from making that phone call, they were able to access a huge, um, portion of additional funding. So they were signed up to a new program within two weeks that's going to let them expand their business, open a new um, business center even in that province. And so you can unlock a lot of information just by having those conversations and engaging in those ways. Um, my answer is always going to go back to kind of the organizing and advocacy work because uh, it's my thing, but that's my best advice is A, look to the past and B, don't be afraid to have a conversation or reach out and ask someone what's going on because they're usually happy to help. And they're also right now a little bit afraid that if a lot of funding goes out, there won't be businesses there to meet the demand um, or to finish the projects that they are trying to fund. And so just saying that you're there and you're ready to work and being ready for that money to come through would, uh, I think, be a big help in getting the kind of funding that we want to see. That's great. I know that um, Carbon 613 and, and our sort of uh, national group, uh, Green Economy Canada, is doing a lot of advocacy these days on green stimulus. Uh, so it's good to hear that it's kind of coming from all fronts. And uh, yeah, if, if any of our members out there are listening and they um, are interested in how they can get involved or contact uh, the right people, uh, obviously reach out. Carbon 613 is here to help. So uh, let us know and, and we can connect you with that. Um, thanks, Kirsten. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, well, it's been a few minutes now. Looks like you had a very thorough presentation that covered everything. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, well, if uh, unless anyone else has any questions, obviously uh, they're welcome to follow up after the fact. We'll be sending out a little follow-up package and um, we can get you in touch with Kirsten if you think of something after the fact and think, oh, I wish I had asked that when I had the chance. We'll make sure you get that chance. Um, so thank you very much, Kirsten, again, for joining us today and sharing all those insights. Uh, thanks as well to all of our attendees who took the time to join us today and learn some things that hopefully you can bring back to your own workplaces uh, and businesses to keep pushing the envelope on business sustainability in Ottawa and across Canada. Um, don't forget to sign up for Carbon 613's newsletter if you have not already. Uh, again, there's a link in the chat. Mandy may even post another one for you. And uh, it's the best way to stay informed about these kinds of great upcoming events with speakers like Kirsten and, uh, and other things that Carbon 613 can do during this sort of working from home digital online era. So. Um, 
There you go. Manny's posted a link in the chat, so feel free to sign up for the newsletter there. Uh, you can also find us at envirocenter.ca. Um, and thanks again, and have a great afternoon, everyone, and Kirsten. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, everybody, and thanks for your attention. Um, for you guys, should I just, I'll just send you an email with the links um, to share it to everyone. Does that work? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, cool. Mandy is generally the one who's on top of that right now, but obviously you can kick with me and uh, we can start yeah, out. Yeah, send that to me. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. She's always the one with the plan, so that's great. Nice. How are you doing, Darren? How did, what did you think? <laughs> if he's there. Stop sharing now, please. Mm, must not be there. <laughs> no, maybe. Gonna, oh, there oh, he is. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, well done. That was already great. Sorry, I was just doing dishes in the background while watching. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was fun. Thanks, Darren. Thanks for coming. No problem. I admire your technology skills. When I had to screen share, I panicked. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, sometimes it's just like, all right, I'm just going to go for it, and yeah. whatever happens, happens. <laughs> you work uh, great, Mandy. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, Kirsten, just send us your info. We'll send out that follow-up email. I have it. Good to go. So we'll just uh, insert your information, and uh, hopefully we can do cool. some together again soon. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a good Thank day. you so much, Kirsten. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye-bye.